Good evening and welcome to our second episode of Happy Hour with the Historian. Um, just a quick notice, uh, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram as far as uh, looking for the uh, Old Independence Regional Museum or if you'd like to see this video later um, or share it with your friends, you can also follow us on YouTube by looking up and searching for OIRM Museum. Um, tonight we'll be joined with uh, Mr. Craig Ogilvie and Mr. Sam Cook here to discuss Polk Bayou. Uh, Craig is no stranger to the business uh, baseball region. He was uh, the editor of Baseball Guard in the 70s and has written extensively about our regional history for, uh, for over 50 years now. Uh, his cartoons about historic Arkansas have appeared in uh, newspapers and magazines since 1975. He has served as the president of the local historic society at, starting at age of 24 and has continued to write historical type articles um, since his retirement from the Arkansas Department of Parks and Tourism. Give me a grab mic. Is it too low? Okay. So I can hear me as well. Um, as far as his, his roots run very deep here in local history, uh, his great great grandparents came here in the in 1836 to help settle this beautiful valley uh, in the Poke Bayou Basin. And so it is appropriate that he is here to speak um, on the early history of, of Poke Bayou in the town. And also, we have Mr. Sam Cook, who is our chairman of the board for the directors of Poke Bayou, other Poke Bayou. The, of the Pogue Bayou Foundation, excuse me. And he's also the vice president of the board of directors of Friends of the North Fork and White Rivers. He works as a doctor of optometry uh, at White River Eye Care, uh, received his doctorate in optometry from the U University of Houston, and has a Bachelor of Arts in Zoology from uh, University of Arkansas. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Ogilvy and kick this off. Yes, sir. Thanks. Thanks, Clint. Uh, when Amy Howard uh, called and asked that I join uh, Sam here tonight, uh, I'm sure she wasn't aware that uh, that I was a direct descendant by of uh, some of the early people who settled uh, the upper regions of Polk Bow and Sullivan Creek. Um, but uh, just quickly, I'll say that uh, John G. Wilson, his wife, came here from Tennessee in uh, 1836 and settled a large uh, uh, farm on, uh, on Sullivan Creek, just, just upstream about a mile from where it enters uh, Polk Bayou. Um, tagging along soon after them was uh, their daughter, Betsy, and her husband, Tinsley Ogilvy, and they were my great, great grandparents. So uh, I was delighted to come and tell you a few things about, uh, about the settlement of uh, Batesville, which was originally called Polk Creek, uh, and, but most people called it Polk Bayou. Uh, but uh, I'd like to first talk a little bit about why uh, the settlers chose this particular area. Um, first of all, they were drawn, often drawn here by speculators, uh, always wanting to sell land. And uh, so it was natural that uh, the speculators descended on this area and, uh, and offered land for sale and uh, also promoted building a town here, which would also help land sales. Uh, that was 200 years ago this year. About 90% of everyone who came here were farmers, and they found quickly that if they were able to clear the land, they had rich soil to use. And uh, most of the time, the land was affordable. Uh, the rivers were their, their main highways, and the bow was the first high-volume spring-fed stream that they came to as they approached the Ozarks. This made it outstanding as a year round uh, shipping port and it was convenient for them to use for the downtown markets all the way to, Saint, uh, to uh, New Orleans. It also, had a trading, uh, it also had a trading post where they could buy, sell, and keep in touch with the outside world. <clears throat> Uh, 
the first shopkeepers or trading post people, merchants, to set up business here did not keep diaries for us so that we could easily find out what they were all about. But they did keep in contact with their relatives and business associates in other cities up north. And uh, a lot of their papers and letters have been preserved even to this day. And that's a way that we get a glimpse into the very early days of Poke Bao, the town. And they also tell us that the raw frontier here was not quite as rough and tough as you might think. For instance, on June 1st, 1815, Christian Wilt in St. Louis wrote his partner, John C. Ludwig, at Polk Bow that he was shipping him more goods to sell at his store. In addition to gunpowder and beaver traps and cooking pots and maybe some farm tools, Mr. Wilt sent a stock of fine silk, which he was, which he told his partner to sell for four dollars a yard. Now, four dollars a yard in uh, 1815 was quite a sum, and it's amazing that they had people here at that time that could afford four dollar a yard silk. Judging from that alone, perhaps Pope Bow was not quite uh, the uncivilized town that we might think of uh, today. <clears throat> the trading post of Wilt and Ludwig was not the first to be located here. There's a record that John Reed, a man named John Reed, was operating a post here by 1812. And it was his place that I uh, attempted to capture in a painting that appeared on the Independence County Chronicle uh, in January of 2020. The little village uh, got a post office on November the 7th, 1820. But an error in the paperwork made it come out Polk Creek. But all the mail addressed to Polk Bow made its way uh, here just fine. No one cared enough to try to change the name of the mistake, so it remained Polk Creek until officially changed to Batesville on January the 7th, 1824. Actually, the most mail received, most of the mail received here after 1821 was addressed to Batesville, even though the name had not been changed at that time. The flatlands along the rivers were covered with hardwood trees, cane breaks so thick that a human could not squeeze through it unless you could find a buffalo track uh, trail or a, or a bear path. That was the only way you could penetrate the cane breaks. Poke Bow, uh, likewise, was lined with thick cane, 15 feet tall, all the way up to the hill country. Stands of trees were scattered only here and there. And down where the bow meets the river was a massive stand of pokeweed, <laughs> which attracted thousands of birds every year when the berries were in season. The pokeweed became a landmark for river travelers, and they soon started calling the creek poke bow. Now I wish to preach just a moment about the little controversy over P-O-K-E and P-O-L-K. Anyone who studies local history will learn that it no doubt was originally called, uh, spelled P-O-K-E. I only wish that the stream had been named Pokeweed Creek or Pokeweed Weed Bow so that there would be no doubt in anyone's mind. The spelling P-O-L-K was inadvertently written into one or two reports and even on one U.S. map uh, back in the early 1800s. Sadly, it was also spelled P-O-L-K on a bronze plaque that's set into the concrete 
of the 1930 Bow Bridge down on Central Avenue. We're not sure who was responsible for getting it spelled P-O-L-K, but it's there. And not long ago, a big feature article in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette <clears throat> splashed P-O-L-K bio throughout an article. Very nice article, but they misspelled P-O-K-E. <laughs> uh, afterwards, our own Chamber of Commerce sadly started calling it P-O-L-K bio on its own website. I uh, called and complained about this, and they they did go in and put also, uh, after P-O-L-K, they put also known as P-O-K-E. <laughs> Recorded history and maps back to 1814 clearly state that the bow is P-O-K-E, and we have no reason or authority to change it now. So by 1814, Polk Bow was a leading center that catered mostly to trappers by swapping fur pelts and bear oil for gunpowder and whiskey. Uh, you'll notice that even on the Arkansas Traveler, the official painting down at the History Commission in Little Rock, that they had a little wooden sign above the door advertising whiskey. And it was true that it was a popular trade item that was brought up river and uh, traded for furs. Slowly, one or two families at a time, the population of, uh, of this area started to grow. When Schoolcraft passed through in 1819, on his way home after exploring the upper reaches, reaches of the White River, he wrote that Polk Bow was a village of about a dozen dwellings. The town was in the making, and the greatest thing that happened before it could be renamed Batesville was the opening of a U.S. land office here in 1820. It brought settlers from more than 100 miles around to Batesville to register their land claims. Less than a year after, the new town was dedicated in 1821. The lower end of Main Street flooded four feet into the stores on Lower Main. The old trappers had warned that it would happen. They had been here through floods and they warned the people that was building stores down there that it would flood, but they didn't listen. The slow movement of the business district then started for higher ground to avoid the flooding. As stores were flooded or burned, they were often rebuilt on higher ground up the main street. By the mid 1850s, Batesville's main street, shopping area extended up past Broad Street, today's Broad Street, and the new 1957 courthouse debuted on the site where our present courthouse sits today. Uh, the old courthouse uh, had been located down near the sale barn, what we all know locally as the old sale barn area. And there was not a single picture made as far as we know <laughs> of that building. And it's so, it's so frustrating that it stood for many years after, uh, after the, uh, courthouse was moved, the building remained on site. But anyway, Polk Bow, the stream, played an, a role in virtually every important advancement in our early history, and it will continue to do so if the people will save and protect this natural resource. This is only a small glance at the first 40 years of our local history. For more information, I'd suggest that you get find an addition up, up from the river. And if uh, the early the first part of that is devoted to the very things that I talked about here this evening. And that's all I have for right now. Uh, Sam Cook 
is here to tell us uh, more about <coughs> the geology and the makeup of, of the stream that uh, we that I have come to love because of many reasons. But uh, uh, thanks, Sam. And sure. Thank Sam. you. Thank you, Craig. Um, there, when I think of Pope Bow, I think of, uh, of the watershed of mm -hmm. Pope Bow. And it's, it's the watershed is, is the land uh, that supports the, the streams, the water, all the streams and branches and creeks that flood into Pope Bow, all the caves and springs and that make it up. And really what I wanted to talk about today is, is more about uh, um, the importance of Pope Bow to our, our history and, and about the, the natural history of uh, Pope Bow. And um, how did, how did uh, the nature of the physical nature of Pope Bow change over the years and, and uh, what happened uh, after the settlers came? Um, I, I also represent uh, the Pope Bow Foundation that, that uh, is a recent formation. And uh, um, our mission is to conserve and develop and promote uh, the Pope Bow watershed to improve the quality of life in, in this community. Um, but I'll get back to the Pope Bow Foundation here in just a minute. Um, you know, historically, as Craig mentioned, uh, Pope Bow provided uh, spring fed water to the early settlers, and that was a major attraction as well, not just the physical location. Um, and it was a, a good safe harbor for the for the boats, um, but also what attracted this people to this area: the land, the water, the um, natural resources, the abundant wildlife. Especially, even before the the pioneer settlers came, it was the it was that it was the abundant wildlife, especially, and the water sheds that sustained um, all of that. Um, the Native Americans preceded uh, uh, the pioneer settlers and, and they um, uh, had quite a trade, a network of trade that extended well beyond this area. So they traded among themselves. And, and uh, then when the, settler, the French uh, explorers came and the traders came, it was natural that they would interact with the uh, Native Americans and they, the Native Americans, the Osage tribe uh, pretty much dominated the um, Ozark <clears throat> region, uh, especially that this was their hunting grounds. Um, they didn't have large settlements, but they had base camps here um, in, in the Ozarks. Um, the, every watershed has unique features. Every watershed is unique. Pope Bow is unique. And uh, uh, I want to describe the, the watershed of Pope Bow for you. Um, it's comprised of 111,800 acres, uh, 172 square miles, uh, 290 miles of total stream length. That's all the tributaries and main channels together. Uh, the highest land elevation is 918 feet up in uh, Sharp County. And uh, the highest stream elevation is 860 feet, all the way down to the river at about 243 feet. Um, Poke Bow runs through part of the, the, the very southern section of, of the Ozark Plateau, uh, and which basically ends uh, at the White River and begins up in uh, Missouri, at the Missouri River in, in Missouri. And... Um, also, the uh, geologic formation known as the Springfield Plateau um, runs through the southern section of the, the uh, Ozarks. So, Pope Bow uh, begins in, the, in a uh, sandy rolling hills of, of up northern Independence, southern Sharp County, and then cuts through the, the limestone um, karst limestone rocky rough steep mountainsides uh through the springfield plateau lots of caves and 
and uh, uh, springs in that area. And um, again, which drew a lot of the uh, original settlers to this area, the, the quality of the water. Um, as you travel down Pope Bow, uh, from the north, uh, lots of sandstone bluffs, and then midway down, it changes to limestone. Beautiful bluffs, high bluffs and mountains uh, all the way through almost right to the city limits of Batesville. Um, the lower Pope Bow, and I'm referencing here Miller Creek area and Pfeiffer Creek, uh, are more rolling hills and, and kind of a hard, hard, churdy limestone, uh, sandstone and lots of clay. Um, you know, the earliest, as Craig said, too, the early settlers came in the early 1800s. The, the Wilson family, Ogilvy's, uh, uh, went further north up into the Poke Bow um, Valley and yeah, up into the Sullivan Creek uh, Valley, the Sullivan Creek being the major tributary to Poke Bow. And, um, you know, the settlers were also drawn to the, to the timber um, as well. And another thing that drew a lot of settlers was the ore uh, and the manganese ore industry um, really began in the 1850s. And by the late 1800s, the uh, Andrew Carnegie had a mining operation here and um, St. Louis Mining Company. And uh, this continued on um, with a, a larger industry uh, during World War II and uh, through World War II, and the, the uh, U.S. government stockpiled manganese for strategic reasons, and um, that came to an end about 1960. Uh, we can still see um, evidence of foundations of uh, large ore washing operations uh, scattered up and down the Pope Bow watershed. Um, I spoke to individuals here that had lived here for many years in the 20s and 30s, and they said they could look down at, off the bridge here at Batesville, and, and the waters of Poke Bow were red with the, uh, the, the, uh, the discharge from these ore plants where they washed the, the clay and other minerals out, out of the ore. Um, so in the beginning, they, they uh, dug shafts by hand, uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 feet deep, and then tunneled out into the mountainside from there, picking out the ore by hand. Um, later, uh, they would use heavy equipment like bulldozers to just uh, uh, dig trenches in the mountainsides, and they would pick the ore out by hand. Um, so you can still see in the hills uh, trenches that are just dug out and mounds of, of uh rocks uh, just uh, shoved up on a, on a mountainside. And that's usually because that's evidence of the ore operations. Um, so the, the, for a while, the water quality of, of Poke Bow was, was significantly affected. Uh, the timber industry uh, affected all of, not just the Poke Bow watershed, but all of the watersheds in this area and throughout the state, really, the, the Flatlands were uh, deforested, and, and a large part of Poke Bow watershed was, uh, for the most part, uh, there were very few virgin timber left, I would imagine, in the Poke Bow watershed. Um, the uh, hunting and trapping, fur trading was, was a, again, a major attractant to the settlers. And basically, there was unregulated hunting and fishing. Um, that went on until the late 1800s. And um, we also had in that time period, the Civil War, which further decimated the, the natural resources here very, very severely. And uh, so the wildlife were pretty much decimated uh, by the late 1800s here in Arkansas and in, in most parts of the United States uh, to the point where the federal government began to step in and regulate uh, uh, hunting and fishing. Um, Arkansans resisted this uh, for a long time. Uh, and uh, in 1915, though, finally the Arkansas 
established the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And um, as many places here in Polk Bio Watershed, the, the deer population was almost gone, uh, which is hard to imagine. Uh, the bear were gone, the uh, buffalo were gone, um, <clears throat> and, and a lot of mammals. Bird population was decimated by the deforestation that had occurred as well. And um, so th it was the first uh, the area, the, the uh, time of the 1800s was very difficult for, for wildlife, as you can imagine. Um, when the regulation began with the Game and Fish Commission, the wildlife rebounded. And uh, as you know now, the deer population is extremely plentiful, uh, even here in the, in the city of Batesville. And uh, bear have come back, uh, not bison. Um, other large mammals, mountain lions, uh, and coyotes, bobcats, all of these have rebounded a great deal. Bird population, the eagles have come back, uh, and uh, fish population uh, is still good. Uh, the water quality has rebounded uh, in Polk Bow, and in large part to better um, uh, management of the land uh, over the years. Um, The uh, today, uh, the land cover of the total watershed is uh, covered by 60% forest and 30, 31% pasture. The, these are figures taken from the, our own U.S. Geological Survey. And, uh, but there is still a fairly heavy deforestation in the upper and, and the lower third of the Polk Bio watershed. In the middle part, uh, it's heavily forested, and that's mainly because the, the, the mountains are so heavily um, karsted and uh, fractured limestone. It's very difficult to, to farm and build, and, and uh, timber is very slow growing. It's even difficult to timber there in, in, in that area. So, but that, that has helped to improve the the groundwater and the surface water too of the of Polk Bow. Um, the greatest population density in Polk Bow today is obviously in, in the lower part with Batesville and the Miller Creek uh, watershed. Um, you know, I, I have to say with my <laughs> uh, association with uh, uh, nonprofit and watershed groups that uh, we're, we're very mindful of what threats there are to our uh, water quality today. You know, Polk Bio is part of our drinking water. It, it, at one time, that's where Batesville took its drinking water. And now it, it takes it from uh, the White River, just maybe half a mile down from where Polk Bio uh, uh, runs into the White River. So easy, you can easily make an argument that some of our water does come still from Polk Bio. Um, the greatest threats to Polk Bio water quality today are, are still sediment, excess sediment uh, from um, land management that does allow erosion, that still does exist. Uh, unpaved roads throughout Arkansas, but especially here are uh, um, create uh, erosion and excess sediment. Nutrients from uh, pastures, animal waste that spread from poultry operations onto the ground. Um, and um, also chemical pollutants from our own stormwater drains, uh, from our roads, fuels, oils, uh, other chemicals that, that uh, may wash into our stormwaters. Uh, the greatest threats to our wildlife are, uh, I think is just the continued uh, deforestation. Um, the forest uh, really increased the, uh, they are the capacity for the wildlife. That, uh, and the water quality of, of the Polk Bio watershed. Um, so th that hopefully will give you a picture of the, of the, it's a very brief picture <laughs> of the natural history of, of Polk Bio. Um, and um, I, I've spent a lot of time on Polk Bio myself. Uh, I was friends with Stephen Wilson, uh, our late great uh, Arkansas Game and Fish director who grew up here in Batesville. 
And like a lot of us that have lived here for a long time, Steve uh, had his first canoeing, camping, fishing experiences on on Pope Bio, and that's where his love for the the uh, great outdoors began. Um, and today I'm, uh, as I mentioned, uh, representing the Pope Bio Foundation, and um, and we incorporated in May of 2020, and we're our nonprofit status is pending. Um, but we're comprised of, of mainly just a, a board membership of up to 15 people. We have representatives from the city and the colleges and uh, other institutions here in the chamber. But these are people that are very enthusiastic about the history of Batesville and the the, uh, the conservation of, of the Polk Bio watershed, especially in the, in this uh, lower stretch here. Uh, we, we have some... Um, projects now that we have begun in earnest, um, one of which is a, uh, uh, a trail, uh, yeah, a pedestrian trail that would extend from basically White Drive Bridge down to White River Bridge, about a four-mile stretch. And this is a very large project, and, um, and um, the it has begun in earnest, as I said, that we will be seeking grants soon for the lower sections of the trail, which will go through historic downtown Batesville. And um, um, we've had donations of land uh, as well. The Barnett family has donated land uh, at the uh, just upstream from the uh, Golden Overpass. Um, we look for uh, small craft accesses to be built. Uh, we're seeking help from different uh, agencies, state agencies to, to do this. And uh, um, we'll be seeking funds someday for uh, matching, uh, matching funds for these grants. So we hope to have accesses, uh, better accesses on the upper stretch at White Drive Bridge, as well as downtown and, and near the confluence of the White River. Um, we've had, we've had a cleanup project. We started one last year, but a lot of people have had cleanup projects on Polk Bio. We're extremely grateful for those people that do volunteer for, for, uh, cleaning up, uh, Polk Bio. The scouts have been extremely active in, in doing these every year, uh, different, uh, church groups, student groups, Lyon College student groups have been very active in helping to clean up Polk Bio. And that's an that is an ongoing project. We'll be having um, some of those again this year. Um, we've we've also um, we're also fostering stream teams. That's an official name given by the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. These are teams which are registered with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, and uh, these are volunteer teams um, that are monitoring water quality. They may be cleaning up, having, uh, having cleanup projects or stream bank restora restoration projects. Um, the West Elementary uh, students have for years uh, had a stream team, and they lead the way in monitoring the water quality of, of this lower section of Polk Bio. Um, now the Game of Fish will allow us to enter, send data to them by the computer. And, and this is a live time uh, database that's available for, for us to see. Um, they have given us um, a grant for a, um, chemistry analysis to be done. And uh, Lyon College will be also having a stream team. Uh, the Batesville High School East uh, students will have a stream team and then, and then even another adult stream team will be formed uh, soon. So uh, we invite uh, anybody that wants to volunteer with any of our projects to, to please notify us and, and let us know that you're available. Um, we, we look at the, the erosion that may be occurring with uh, Polk Bio, we, we've had a biologist survey the stream bank conditions and identify certain areas that are problematic. And, and so we, we hope to take corrective measures uh, for those stream banks 
at some point in the future. Uh, so that's that's kind of a, a a brief explanation of what we're doing with with Pope Bio. We you know as as we uh, build trails, we also want to connect the history of Batesville uh, along the way uh, and and conserve the uh, watershed at the same time. Gentlemen, we do have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, uh, I guess I would like to go in order, but uh, there was one that kind of pertained to trails and stuff. We had a question about what about a bike trail? Is there plans for bike trail? Well, that would be a combination pedestrian and bike trail that I, that I spoke of. Yeah. Okay. And Batesville has a master plan of trails and, and that trail would hopefully someday interconnect with the other trails that, that the city is planning. The other question was, um, is the location of the original post snow? Uh, no, it's in fact, it's probably uh, not even on land at this time. It's, it could be anywhere. It could even be underneath the current location of the bow where it enters the river. Okay. In that case, there's no more questions. I would like to thank Mr. Cook and Mr. Ogilvie for joining us this evening. Um, and again, I'd like to remind everybody that if you could, please uh, like and follow us on uh, Facebook and Instagram. As far as the old regional, or old Independence Regional Me Independence Museum, yeah, you can speak this evening. That'd be great. Um, and as also, if you want to be able to uh, see our videos and everything, please uh, look for us on YouTube at OIRM Museum. And that'll conclude our uh, episode for this evening. Thank you all for joining us.